Our next speakers are Sue Hamilton and Ruth Whitehouse. Sue is a professor of prehistory. <laughs> Sue is a professor of prehistory here at UCL. <laughs> She's a specialist in later European prehistory, and she's currently co-directing the Rapa Nui Landscape of Construction project. Which is not in Europe, but the Pacific. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. So the Easter Island, okay. But um, I was just trying to condense all the stuff. That's quite all right. <laughs> in any case, so uh, Ruth is, said, is, also, is also a professor at UCL, and her main research area is prehistoric Italy with a focus on religion and ritual, and today I will present this beautiful paper about revis revisiting sacred and profane the main change in South Italian history. Well, my aim is not to give a long paper, to give you an introduction which sets the scene, and then to work through images and raise issues as we go. Um, I did point out that I worked in the Pacific as well because I want to say that sensory archaeology and phenomenology take you places and I think that's a really interesting issue, the extent to which you have a universal methodology that you can repeat and ask in different places or how much you're dealing with a place-specific experience and I would say that the work that I'm doing with Ruth bridges those two things. It's not either or. It's not that you're experiencing something in that, that place, a place, and it's unique to it, or to take a phenomenological view, we're all human beings, we all move in certain ways, we can see to the left or the right. There is such a thing as the universal body, and aspects of the universal body, and the results you get, which we will be looking at, can actually, we would suggest, create a database that can be used by many to ask very specific questions of different places. So part of what I want to show you also relates to the idea of scale. Can you look at a whole landscape? Can you look at seven square kilometers? Can you look at 45,000 square kilometers? And what scale can you do sensory archeology span and phenomenology? Because it inevitably, in what we've been looking at, gets back to specific places. So can you broaden it out and use it beyond the specific, well, specific place I'll go back to in terms of my pronunciation. Um, a lot of what we've been seeing incorporates um, views that are bird's eye views. So how do you express it and show it via slides? I'm interested in, we're interested in body-centered experience. So that's what I would say is the bottom line of what we're doing. You can call it phenomenology, you can talk about it in a sensory way, but the whole thing that it hinges on is as perceived by the bodies of individuals. It's not just single individuals, we work in teams, and we had questions raised by the last paper about can you do it with anybody in the present, and does it relate to the present? Um, we worked in teams with people who were archaeology students, they were interested in archaeology, that they had no experience in the main of the places we were working. So that imbuing yourself with place and knowledge of place before you begin, I don't think it's what it's about either. It's about understanding your methods you're doing, why you're doing them, and where they can take you. So we're going to look at the sacred and the profane, which I think are interesting overlaps. And usually people look at ritual sites, or there's some consideration of domestic sites, but bringing the two together in sensory archaeology is regularly avoided. So we started working on profane sites, as you will see from the slides. We worked towards thinking about a particular sacred or ritual site. And then beyond that, how do you connect the two? How do you journey from a place of profane life, everyday life, to a place of ritual? So this is what I want to introduce, and then, as I say, we're just going to roll through the slides, so I'm not going to talk a lot at any individual slide. So this paper addresses sensory aspects of the domestic and the ritual in prehistoric sites in southern Italy. We and others have looked at this subject before in terms of broad contrast, including sensory characteristics between the two types of site and environment. 
But on this occasion, we want to think about movement from the one to the other. In prehistory, such movements would have taken place in the context of specific ritual activities such as initiation lights, commemoration events, and perhaps pilgrimages. And I want to pull out that idea of pilgrimage. So we aim to, re to reconstruct or reimagine the journeys from settlements to ritual sites and the series of sensory transformations that would have taken place en route. So this sensory aspect of movement from the profane to the sacred is important because it's an aspect of movement that would probably have paid, played a major role in instilling individuals of the feeling of change, irrevocable change, change personhood that is fundamental to the rituals described. So you're going on an intellectual journey, you're going on a sensory journey, and possibly between the profane and the ritual, you are a changed person at the end of the journey. And some of that change is psychological, but some of it is a pace sensory change as well. So the place where we will end up in, in this journey is the cult cave site of Grotta Scaloria, which is close to the Adriatic coast on a limestone plateau that forms the southern foothills of the Gargano promontory. Located on the edge of the area occupied, or on the edge of the area where the Grotus Gloria is, are the well-known ditch sites of the Tavolieri Plain, which I will be showing you. So these form the first Neolithic, the earliest Neolithic of southern Italy, and were dated roughly to the mid of the sixth millennium BC. Grotta Scaloria itself consists of a lower chamber with a cult dedicated to stalagmites and silicide water and an upper chamber with a deposit containing fragmented, carefully cleaned human bones found together with domestic refuse. Recent analysis of the bones suggests that some of the bones belong to individuals who may have lived from some distance away from the site. So we have caught these two ends of a story. And only recently, after we did our field work, Ruth came up with some interesting finds actually on the Tavolieri settlements. So the caves have got stalagmites and stalactites. They've got balls of calcite or calcite calcite. And these are things that are found in caves such as Grotus Gloria. Well, on the settlement sites, we have painted pebbles, but some of them are painted calcite balls that can only have come from caves. Equally, I mean, this is really from the profane to the sacred. We've got a bit of spelling tight here on a piece of kitchen paper, neatly <laughs> photographed for us by John Rob, yes. which was found on one of these Tavolieri settlements. <coughs> so what the hell is that doing there? And where did it come from? And these are the sorts of things that when you return to databases, you begin to get ideas that were not there prior to your journey from the profane to the sacred. So now I want to travel that journey, show how our field works evolved, and think about the methods we've used, because we've talked about experience in the past. Our method is not to experience the past, but to think about the experiences of the past and how that would help us interpret archaeological data. So there's something separate there. Uh, this is where we're working, on the Tavolieri Plain, on the edge of the Gargano. This is the landscape which we're working on, a series of cross-cutting rivers across the Great Plain of the Tavolieri. And on the edge of that is Grotta Scaloria. The settlements, there's probably over a thousand, many more than we geo-reference, but there's about 700 plus geo-reference settlements. We're dealing with an area on the Tavolieri Plain of 4,500 square kilometres, I've given you the approximate date, the second half of the 6th millennium BC. So this is fascinating. It's one of the most famous early Neolithics of Europe, and um, it's comprising ditched enclosures with sea ditched enclosures inside. Um, they're known from the aerial photographs of Bradford during the Second World War, and um, today you virtually cannot see them on the ground. So how do you do phenomenology or sensory archaeology in a place you can't even see on the ground. 
a bit, a bit of a challenge. And how do you do it across 4,500 kilometres? Another bit of a challenge. Well, we did try to do it. So how do you get there? First, find your site. You can't experience things or think about experiences without finding your site. We had to work from old photographs with roadways on them to newer photographs from Google Earth and work between the different roadways, measure things off. And finally, you can geo-reference something from these aerial photographs, working between modern aerial photographs and past ones. And there you are, you get to your place. Great, here is one of these great ditched enclosures that we're going to think about the experience of the profane um, within it. So we set up what I'd call a series of sensory-based sites. How do you sense a place like that? Or ask questions, archaeological questions of it. The first thing we had to do was flag out what we knew. Flag out the perimeters, which we get from our geo-referencing from the aerial photographs. Flag out the locations of specific enclosures. Um, so these are all sea ditched enclosures in an otherwise invisible site. Um, we know the sites are real, not just from the air, but they do produce pottery. And the intensity of the sites on the plain is such that it's quite likely that they lacked trees. So the level of clearance, their cereal agriculture from what we have excavations and finds. So we have some sense of the environment, but we have to then start asking questions. How are the sites laid out? Could you signal somebody from the one perimeter to the other to lay out these ditched enclosures? Could you, in the smaller enclosures, are they family enclosures? Do people communicate with each other, etc.? So these are social questions about how you experience the past, not about ritual, but how people use senses to socially organise themselves and communicate with each other. So what types of senses do we use? We have to think about vision. But vision isn't just a view stretch, can you see something in the distance? It's can you see it and understand it? If I do a little tiny signal here, can you see what I'm doing? If I do this, can you see what I'm doing? Different scales of signals will give you different capabilities of socialising. So we did have one student who was an actress, and she showed us how on stage grand actions and little actions are what you're trained to do to visually communicate through body action um, the capabilities of the information you want to put forward. So we have built up a profane database based on smell, movement, and different scales of vision, colour, can you see colour or not from a distance, different types of fabrics, can you see fast or sheepskin from greater or lesser distances, um, types of hats people wear, can you tell who's approaching you from a distance, etc. Um, it's not just games, we have to do these things again and again, and take measurements and record them. And I have the biggest database somewhere in here now. You can ask me any question about how far a baby's cry goes or whatever. I can tell you. How far do you think a baby's cry goes? Can I have it in meters? Any ideas? 27. <laughs> I know it. It's, we, we, we weren't cruel to the babies. We just did <laughs> when they cried. But isn't that fascinating? Because actually, the spacing between the little enclosures will separate a baby's cry. So it actually tells you something about the possible social use of those enclosures. So that's just an example. We did things in woodland. We did them on open ground. We did them in different seasons. Um, you do have to be careful. We, we, we've tried to distance over which you can smell dung. There's a lot of dung in the excavations of the ditched enclosures, but we had prod in the dung, so we kept on smelling it well beyond. <laughs> so you have to keep doing the experiments again and again. And that is robust. That's not just experiencing and making a description. It's robust, body-centred um, registry. <laughs> We've measured it out with GPSs, we have walkie-talkies, so we can tell each other when different sounds and noises are beginning. And out of that, we began to create an understanding of the different scales of social activity, everyday social activity, at these invisible sites. And I'm just getting you a feel of it rather than explaining every slide. And we do have one site where they've attempted to reconstruct a house within its enclosure. This is a summary of the types of things out of what we do that we would say were the predominant senses within inside one of those houses. And I had great fun going into that pod 
because that's what it's like. It, within these houses, there would have been very little light. What do you do in a place with little light? It's constrained activities. It's done by feel. We had this emphasis on sight. And when I would put the jet inside that pod, the polished jet I could feel, I could slightly see from the candlelight, but I couldn't the dull. That's a great experiment, because actually if you're doing small crafts within a house, you'd be doing it by feel. You wouldn't be doing it by colour. You'd be doing it by shape. We put loads of beautiful painted pottery in the Italian community, and we put rusticated and inscribed. You would have only understood the, the rusticated material inside. Surely the outsides where the beautiful painted pottery would have been displayed. So by combining these experiments with the actual locales, we developed a series of questions that are ongoing. So here's sand, and very interesting, uh, the maximum distance over which sand goes is a kilometre, and that was wood and wood, playing a samantrum. So these settlement sites may not be individual, but they are interaudible. So that says something too about the scale of society across that great Tivoli plain. And um, female shouting goes further than male, which I find quite interesting, for giving instructions. Um, so, Think, okay, you think, well, it's so obvious, but it isn't, because we have to retrain our bodies into the things that were important senses in the past. And so they have an absolute level about them. You could take these measurements and try them on another place. Um, obviously, conditions of climate, um, wind, etc., all have to be listed, but it's a database that can grow. <coughs> so that's what we had for the profane. And we decided we'd think about the relationship between the sites on the clay and um, a journey to a very well-known ritual site, Grotta Scaloria. The nearest um, settlement, ditched enclosure to it, is about 13 kilometres away. Obviously, if you were further back in the Tivoli area, it would be further. So it's a journey from the Tivoli area across the Peggy Gargani curve, which is the foothills of the Gargano, and then ultimately, on those foothills, you get what is Gloria. Well, how do you do a journey in a modern landscape where most things are in visual, in, invisible? We have starting points and the sites you choose to start from. So this is the nearest one. You know where you're aiming for, but where you're aiming for is a bit of a problem because of those, those what is Gloria has been looked at in the past. Its actual entrance is now gone. So we had to have a proxy entrance, which is another swallow hole near where the Grotta Scaloria swallow hole would have been, which is this Grotta of Occhio Pinto. So there you are, you're already needing proxies to think your way into this landscape. Um, you can't read the red, but this is the landscape of Grotta Scaloria. How do you do phenomenology in an industrial landscape? Um, just go back to the maps or have a go? Well, we went to look at Grotta Scaloria. The entrance is no longer there. This is our proxy one nearby, which is pretty grotty looking, but we can you know, still begin the journey. We know roughly what we might want to do and where we want to go. So I just want to think a little bit about the journey, then take you on the journey. So traditionally, there's been a focus on the locale of ritual rather than the spatial and experiential route to that point. So that's what we were aiming to get to, from where we've been working on this, the everyday life of the, the inhabitants of the Tavoli area to this point, and what is the experiential journal, journey. I think Turner's work on pilgrimage, although old now, is very useful. It sees the idea of ritual as a processual set of stages, which gradually separate you from the world you've left to the world you're going to. And it has two concepts. One is personal encounter, so every person's bodily sensory experience on a journey. But in pilgrimage, there's also communitas, that you're with groups of people and sharing that event. So I think they're quite useful ideas to think about the possible journey. And usually on pilgrimages, there are kind of points of juncture and transition. So in a religious pilgrimage, it might be key chapels and churches, but they're kind of stages on the journey, which are physical experiences for the communitas. And the importance of these junctures is that of transformation, that you've caught 
past that feet, but also the increasing direction of intensity as you work to the final point. So if you think about pilgrimages from churches to churches, the final point of arrival is always the grandest one with huge flights of steps up to it, etc. So here we are, we're beginning our journey on a relatively bleak day for the Tivoliere, crossing the Tivoliere. And there's a kind of monotony, but we have to think of all the things we've thought about, about how you would hear between different settlements and the different points we know from our other work on the profane. And then there is a seminal point. Whichever way you do it, because there's more than one choice, you will reach the Peggy Gargano. So there's a point that's a barrier in front of you that you have to climb up. One route, you come to it quite slowly. Another route, you'd have to skirt around um, a lagoon, which is known as the Salty Coastal Lagoon. Now gone, so what you do? It's not there now, it's in field. But we're still going to take our journey, so we use the proxy lagoon that's nearby. So the idea of proxy, I think, is quite interesting. Experiencing proxy. So here we are, another route is, you haven't quite reached the Gargano, the pretty Gargano, but you experience lapping water, different animals, different smells. But whichever way, there's a kind of transitional and gradual route. But finally, you get up onto the pretty Gargano, and wow, Ross is Scaloria. Not in sight, because it's a swallow hole, but it's there. You know it's somewhere there. But this is where it gets really difficult. I once read from Chris Tilly, how do you do phenomenology on a, land, uh, on a roundabout, when he found one of his megaliths on the roundabout. Well, we cross ourselves up on the Peggy Gargantha. We, we don't know. Did it have vegetation or not? There are no settlements up there that show that it was cleared in cereal agriculture. So we have to imagine two sorts of journeys. We have to go into other woods, um, ancient woods such as the Timparanato, and think about how sun travels, what light's like. But we can still begin to work and describe these experiences and have a great time measuring the distance over which you can bang a drum and hear it. So we put ourselves through a sylvan landscape or a cast landscape <coughs> with lots of brights, etc. And we're getting near our geo-reference Grottus Gloria. And what do we find? an oil factory, um, a place for clothes, processing clothes, mainly white knickers, God knows what's going on there. So what do you do? Do you walk away from it? Or do you, this is the height of your experience. We have arrived, <laughs> finally arrived, at Grossa Scaloria. It's really it's so exciting. Uh, but no, it's, I mean, I think there's some sort of drug users and needles and God knows what there. But there is the swallow hole. We can surely have some experiences of the swallow hole. And something we thought about the way you enter it, you know, the way you would have entered it, you'd actually face the Gargano. Or is it the other way around, Bruce? No, I think it is. Right, you face. So this is the experience of looking at some amazing, huge mountain barrier. So you, we have to sort of think through these different stages, but it is another stage. You've got somewhere, you face to the hills, and you sink down. So we did sink down, we did scrabble down our proxy swallow hole, which has another sort of entry into these caves and passageways, which is now blocked. But the moment we go down, the temperature changes, sound changes. So these things are worth doing because you do see these seminal changes in experience. And with Ruth looking in and me looking a bit fed up that it's not so beautiful as I'd hoped. Um, so we have to do our experiments here too. We tried different types of experiments, speaking, chanting, playing drums, and seeing how far away from that swallow hole could you hear them. You really, by about 70 metres, you can't. You can hear some of these sounds at 30 metres or 50 metres. So it's invisible. It's a swallowed-in world that you're going into. So as you get near, you will hear some signs and noises and changes in temperature. And then what happens? All this night you've been going through and the white limestone, you go into the dark. It's like going into that pod house. You go into the dark. And suddenly, rather remarkably, the changes in senses are actually like going into a Neolithic house, which I summarised at the beginning. Everything's more tactile. You're not, nothing's based on sight anymore, it's based on sounds. So this is Grotta Scaloria, and there's an upper chamber which does have some domestic refuse and some bones, but the burials 
are in the lower chamber. And this is how you get them. You have to squeeze under a ledge and then drop down a corridor. So you just basically give up all hope and drop. It's not the burial cell, it's the stalactite. The stalactite, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah okay. So you, you drop down, and what you find at the bottom, as Bruce is pointing out, and is the most important thing, is that there is clearly a ritual site down here, based on the idea of um, stalactites and stalagmites, the cult of silicide water. And there are levelled off um, stalactites or mites, which had pottery placed on them, and then the water would drip into the near little pots, and then the stalagmites or tight stalagmites in that case, and would grow up again. And we know that this is the same date as the settlement because there's painted pottery, there's flashing surfaces decayed, and they collect this dripping water. So this is the sort of darkest um, bit of the cult site. We've now got, um, since we started working on this, and we've worked with people who are re-looking at and re-excavating Brussels Galoria, we've got much more information now about it. Um, an interesting fact, so the bodies which are not in the lower chamber, but the upper one, the bodies are defleshed, and they have been defleshed, it would seem, before deposition. So they're not just put there to rot, they have been somewhere and they have been defleshed. Isotope analysis just isotope analysis suggests that the people who are buried there live part of their life on zones beyond the zone of the cave, in geology similar to where the ditch villages are. So we have people who have come from other places and lived in other places for part of their lives. Now it's possible that people moved around during their lives as they married and they just ended up via marriage strain systems here. But we would suggest that another alternative which we find attractive is that the bones were carried in pilgrimages for deposition in Brockus Galorica, where they became part of an ancestral collection. Now, these are interpretations, but actually going through a very specific bit of sensory archaeology, we've got to some really interesting answers. And then to find, subsequently, with researching through the databases, that on some of the settlement sites, there are actually objects which have, could only have come from the caves. This journey has linked us between two zones. So, I'm used the sensory archaeology here in many ways. First of all, it doesn't stand alone. It's not either or. It's not that you do phenomenology or you don't do it. You do it as part of a wider project <coughs> and idea of things. It's a way of thinking. And it's not about straight reconstruction. It's a way of thinking and asking questions that you're using your senses to explore and possibly answer. So, it leads us through many types of archaeology. It's led us from aerial photographs, it's led us from geography, it's led us from pollen analysis to know what the vegetation's like. It can only for us work in those various different ways. And out of that, I would suggest that we're creating a database which is quite big, so we, when it's published, it will be a lot on how you can sense different things in different ways at different distances, which we would like other people to add to and also see if they find it useful and helpful to think their way into how other spaces are used. So that's what I've got to say. I'm sure it's prompted questions for now or later. Um, but thank you very much for letting us present it.